Now I learned in one of my 12-step programs about museum states. And those are states, emotional states from the past that we just get addicted to. Uh, so, <sighs> life is a struggle. Okay, that's struggleaholic. Just addicted to struggle. Everything has to be hard. If it's if it's worthwhile, it's going to take a, a lot of effort. Uh, struggleaholic, addicted to struggling. That's uh, one museum state I have. Uh, another one is uh, just utter hopelessness. Doesn't matter. No matter what I do, it doesn't matter. The odds are stacked against me. Uh, remember that one, or you know, life is so unfair. That was uh, that was a state that I used to get into, and then I'd get into the giddy state of. Of, uh, I'm the new sheriff in town. I'm going to set the rules from here on in. Or uh, I'll never understand this. It's hopeless. I'm just not good at X, Y, Z. Uh, like that, that addiction to to struggle and to just giving up and feeling of just absolute futility and fatality. And uh, it's amazing the hold that these, these emotional states can have on you, even as you move into your 40s and your 50s, because you, you just go into them so much. Ah. And we are the curates. Certainly by the time we're adults, we don't have to sit in emotional states anymore that don't serve us. So instead of me sitting in the emotional state of, I might as well just give up, doesn't matter what I do, nothing out that works out for me, like the odds were stacked against me from the start. Oh, hate just, just the way that those words affect me. Like, does that, does that cause me to be free and easy in my body and to get some upward direction? No, I just wanna pull down and collapse. Okay, that's collapse thinking leads to, come on, leads to physical collapse. And uh, physical collapse and feeds that emotional state of uh, just giving up and collapse. But I don't have to go there anymore. And I think the thing that helps more than anything else is to, to let go of self-seeking. So instead of just trying to wrest everything I can from other people in, in one-off transactions, if if I have the attitude of uh, how can I be a blessing to other people? How can I cheer up other people today? Can I smile, say a kind word to someone? Can I help someone? Can I lower the emotional temperature on, a, on an argument? Uh, how can I be a blessing to other people? How can I help God's kids? Uh, that emotional state of, of discouragement and futility, it just goes away. It's amazing. I can just pray, God, I know that you, you run the universe, that uh, you're more powerful than I am, and you direct the play that is my life. I'm no longer the director and the actor and the costume designer. You run the show. I I just want to execute your commands. And then I can think about saying or doing something. It's like, okay, God, thinking about telling that person 
you know, all the, you know, everything that's wrong with them, or I'm thinking of quitting my job, or I'm firing this client, or, uh, and uh, then I can just check in with, like, what's my gut reaction when I think about what I want to do, what's my gut reaction, and if my, my gut starts tightening up, if my stomach starts tightening up, if my neck and back start to tighten and to hurt, then, then that intuition is a, is a text message from God. On the other hand, if I have a plan or an idea, that when I think about it, I get an increased feeling of ease, comfort, uh, my back unlocks, my breathing frees up, there's a sense of upward direction flowing through my musculature, uh, I let go of lines of worry on my face. Okay, that's probably a good, good sign, a text message from God that what I'm contemplating doing. Uh, probably a good idea. So, basically live my life these days, be happy, and I know that what will make me happy is following God's will, following the 12 steps, and uh, I just try to avoid situations that don't bring out the, the best in uh, Another I've been addicted to is uh, Chromaholic. All I need is just a few crumbs. That's all I deserve. I've, uh, in the past, I've turned down pay raises. It's like, oh no, I'm not worth that much. I, there's that big part of my psyche that's like, oh no, I'm not worth that much. And then I'd have to beg, borrow, and steal to try to survive. Uh, but uh, I wasn't willing to, to be paid what I was worth to, to test what the market would pay just had this uh, tremendous feeling that uh, you know, I only deserve crumbs. I only deserved uh, just a few of the good things in life. I was not worthy. And uh, again, it's that, that self-obsession that kind of feeds that, that negative feeling of, oh, I'm not worthy, because I'm thinking about uh, my bad points, other than thinking about, okay, how can I be of service to others, make more money, enable me to be of more service to others, to uh, take more responsible choices for my life, to invest for my retirement, to get better health care, uh, take some classes, learn some skills, uh, so that I can be more of a blessing to my clients, uh, my community. And then what are, well, less than her. There's that emotional state of always feeling less than other people. Like, that is a killer. It's feeling that I'm just not as worthy as other people, that I'm, that, uh, that I'm just uh, dirt on, the, on someone's shoe, that uh, I'm just not as worthy as this person. I don't deserve to ask that girl out. I don't deserve the good things in life. Then, I had this uh, emotional state of, of wanting to taunt and to tease other people that I really like. Like when I really like someone, I just want to constantly tease them. It, it must be a distancing device for me to kind of not have to face how important this person is to my life. Like the, the pain of, of that, of that vulnerability of like how much I treasure this friendship, or this this woman, or this community. But but this is mainly to do with individuals, like people that I really admire. Like I admire them so much that it hurts, and I don't think I can handle that. So I've had a lifelong addiction to teasing them. And it starts off lightly and innocuously. Okay, I don't, I don't move in with the heavy guns and go for the really cruel teasing. Just starts off with a little light teasing. But then, when I can get away with it, 
it just gets nastier and nastier. Well, I remember once uh, sitting at a table at uh, the mountaintop minion of Stephen S. Wise, there were about five of us, and uh, we were privileged that Dennis Prager came over to, uh, to sit at our table uh, for, for lunch. And uh, I think the word, uh, a word like uh, stupidity came up. And so I said, uh, Dennis, speaking of stupidity, how's your new book on happiness coming along? It, it was just like incredibly self-defeating. I had so much love for Dennis Prager that I couldn't handle it. I, I just had to sabotage that relationship. And I remember Dennis was kind of taken aback and he said, it's the Sabbath, you get free forgiveness on the Sabbath. I said, I apologize, I, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I'm going free forgiveness on the Sabbath. So Dennis was very gracious, but uh, I was like, I was blowing up a relationship that was important to me. Uh, another time, someone I, I worked with, uh, there was a, a negative article about him in the news, and I just kept hammering on it for weeks. I just kept teasing about it for weeks. And this was someone that I really wanted to be friends with, someone that I actually wanted to work for. And I was addicted to, to, to teasing this guy about something that was obviously a very sore spot. And then this happens to me a lot as a consequence. Out of the blue, this guy just blew up at me in front of other people. Uh, for for a trivial remark that I made, and it just like just tore into me. And boy, I did not like that. And since that conflagration, we've never spoken. Okay, it's been years since then. We've never spoken, and we used to be quite friendly. Uh, but I completely blew up that relationship because I had this emotional addiction to teasing increasingly nasty ways the people I admire most. And I just completely destroyed this, this uh, friendly acquaintanceship and uh, even the, the possibility of working for this man. I, I had a uh, psychiatrist year 2000 who saw me for just three hours one time session and uh, she noted that uh, Luke Luke doesn't know who he is so he's constantly seeking feedback or aka narcissistic supply from other people to tell him who he is and uh, other people inevitably find this exhausting so that they are all driven to put limits on Luke. And once those limits come down, Luke takes this very badly. And then usually behaves in ways that uh, kind of escalate the problem and destroy the, the friendship and the relationship. So, tension seeking, that's, that's another major emotional state that uh, I've had in my life. Uh, it would, in grade school, it would mean like making a lot of rude noises and uh, until the, the girls around me would, would uh, have a genie sixth grade raising her hand and uh, saying to the teacher, could you please ask Luke to control himself? Oh. Or uh, other times like the girls would just start crying. I was like tension seeking, teasing just so much that uh, they just ended up cry crying. Uh, I think uh, this one one woman I was in a class with, she was three years ahead of me in high school and uh, she told someone years later that uh, nobody knew what to do with him. We, we uh, 
he was just, we didn't know what to do with his brain. He was just like constantly uh, provoking, 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 and nobody knew what to do with him. And uh, so yeah, that's an addiction to attention seeking. Seeking is an addiction to having other people to set boundaries on me uh, because I, I didn't have the internal strength to to monitor myself. So when I get to know people, I'd start slowly testing them, find out what the boundaries were because I didn't have the inner strength and sense to determine the boundaries for myself. And so I, I've gotten into this addiction for just testing people, how much they'll put up with, like finding out you know, what's too far. And then some people have been very nice and said, okay, that's over boundary. And I've gotten the message and, and then I've been on good behavior for a few weeks or a few months, go too far once again. And I uh, had a girlfriend who was very good for me and with me in this regard. Uh, when I start to get kind of nasty with my teasing, she'd say, don't be a boob. And that didn't, that didn't crush my spirit. It just reminded me that I was being nasty and, and to stop it. And, and I didn't need to defend myself or I didn't need to escalate. It was just a very sweet way of calling me on my behavior. Don't be a boob. I mean, yeah, that was, that was excellent. Uh, another time I had a girlfriend who confided in me all these uh, kind of painful, awkward things uh, from her life. And then wouldn't you know it, I kind of had this sick feeling when this was happening. I said, ah, I know at some point I'm going to start teasing her about this. And so a few months down the road, I started teasing her about these things that she confided in me that and told me they were you know, very sensitive matters. And I just started like drilling away. People in my past have, have compared me to a dentist who, who finds like the, the sore spot in someone's tooth and then just starts drilling like the sadistic dentist in that movie Marathon Man. And I found on my own power, no matter how much I resolve to, to never tease someone over some painful revelation that they confided in me, that uh, I, I was never able to fully stop myself. That my own power, my own willpower, my own sense of uh, decency and decorum was not enough. I needed God's help. I had this girlfriend who uh, confided in me some very embarrassing experiences and she says if you want to know how to make me cry just bring up this experience and after a month or so I started bringing up this experience and she started crying and she broke up with me she was a beautiful young woman. She was like 15 years my junior. She was beautiful. She was sweet. She was uh, intelligent, articulate, well read. Uh, many wonderful qualities, but I couldn't resist starting to tease her on something she told me would make her cry. I remember in fourth grade or fifth grade, there was this girl who liked me, and so I responded by putting tacks shop side up on her chair and she'd sit on them and uh, it'd be immensely painful of course and and when that wasn't sufficient to, to keep her away from me I, there was one time I think I kicked her it was fifth grade and she said one day you'll love someone who kicks you too Whoa. Whoa. So, uh, in the workplace, I've often got into these states where 
I just try to see how much I can get away with. Like how much I can get away with in not working and goofing off and uh, turning in substandard work. And I, I remember I was working in a radio station and I used to take a lot of pride in my writing. I was writing a lot of the newscasts and, uh, but, but inevitably I got, I got lazy and just tried to get away with putting in the least effort possible. And, uh, and people started talking. It's like, what the hell's happened to the quality of Luke's work? Like he just doesn't even try anymore. And that, that's been a lifelong struggle. Just uh, after a certain amount of time and a job, just, just stop trying. I just, just try to get away with us putting in as little effort as possible. Uh, my parents always noticed from a very early age that I'd always try to, you know, try to get away with putting in the least amount of effort possible, that I'd always try to take the easy way out. If I got caught, I try to lie my way out of problems. So these are all addictions to certain emotional states and attitudes that have continually tripped me up, uh, remo destroyed my ability to sustain relationships, destroyed my ability to succeed at work, uh, destroyed my ability to uh, you know, get along happy, harmoniously with other people, to live in community, to, to build a life. Instead, I was just continually uh, blowing things up. And on my own willpower, I couldn't, couldn't make it more than a few weeks with, uh, with trying my best behavior. So, gotta admit, converting to Judaism did not fix this problem. It was only when I got into 12-step work, did a thorough step one, where I looked at how these emotional addictions have placed my life in peril, placed the lives of other people in peril, have uh, kept me mired in poverty and loneliness and despair. Uh, and then working all the steps, including a complete and thorough and fearless moral inventory in step four, cleaning up the wreckage of my past, asking God to take away my character defects, making amends for the horrible things I've done in the past, step nine, uh, maintaining a constant relationship with God. It's only by doing these things I've managed to receive uh, relief from, from disabling character defects that left me lonely, isolated, poor, frustrated, despairing. Bye-bye. <sighs>